Well, I've been, uh, I've been on holidays for the last four weeks, and so I'm just getting back into the church mode, and I, I definitely had a, an opportunity to disengage. I tried to the best of my ability to not think too much about you, got to be honest. Uh, but uh, I do feel really refreshed this morning, ready to go, and uh, excited to share the Word of God with you today. You know, we've had some great sermons preached this summer. Would you agree? We had eight different uh, preachers preach their life message, and every one of them, I guess I was one of them, but uh, I was going to say every one of them was powerful. That sounds like I'm being arrogant there. I hope mine was powerful. I know I sure enjoyed the other seven. We are blessed as a church with so many gifted communicators. Would you agree with that? Man, we've, we've got a, just so much talent and so much ability and gifting, both young and old. Caleb did a great job last week in his first full preach. <laughs> Heard lots of great feedback on that. I was blessed. I was challenged. You know, Caleb, I, I looked on our uh, church center app to find out just how old you were, Caleb. And I discovered you're going to be 23 here in, in this next month. Been married for a year. You know, I was at a very similar age and phase of life when I had my first, when I was taking my first steps as a preacher and getting my first opportunities. It was a time in my life where God was really stirring me. I had gone through a journey that had led me to surrendering my life to Jesus a few years earlier, and I was beginning to feel this strong sense of call on my life. I was newly married. New in my commitment to serve Jesus, and I can tell you that I was full of dreams and full of visions. I remember hearing a quote sometime in my life, uh, in that part of my life, that was attributed to D.L. Moody, one of the great evangelists that lived uh, quite a while ago. And he made this statement, he said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. And I remember as I was hearing that quote, it stirred something inside of me. And I remember even saying, God, I want to be that man. I aim to be that man. And listening to Caleb preach last week was interesting for me from sort of a nostalgic point of view. You see, something unexpected had happened the week before he preached that had already got me in a reflective mood, and hearing him preach just took it a step further. The last week of my vacation was a staycation here in Regina. My wife, Angela, was back to work already. I still had the week off, and so I played a lot of golf. But I also tried to do one thing productive each day between my morning golf and my afternoon nap. And so one day I decided, you know, maybe I should head down into the storage room in our basement. That's, it is a total disaster, if I'm honest, and try and sort through some of the stuff that needs purging and needs to be thrown out. And I took my daughter, JL, down with me. On the shelf, as I was looking at what was there and kind of going, what is this? I found a, a case that contained all my old music tapes from when I was a teenager. <laughs> tapes, yes. But, you know, I was like, oh, I remember listening to this music. But also in the box were some other tapes that didn't have any labels on them. And before I threw them out, I figured I should see what was on these tapes if there's anything valuable in them before I just toss them. And so I dug around on the shelf and I found an old tape recorder that still worked. At least one side of it did. I had a feeling that some of these tapes might have been some of the prophetic words I received in my life a long time ago. So I dug out the old cassette player and I gave JL a little education on how we listened to stuff in the olden days. And sure enough, some of these tapes contain some of the prophetic words that were part of shaping my life many years ago. 
All the words were given to me before my kids were born. And within a year or two of being married, when I was roughly Caleb's age, I hadn't listened to those for close to 20 years, I would imagine. And it was an interesting experience because as I listened, I found myself just taken right back to the feelings and emotions I had in the moments when I received them. I remembered the excitement. I remembered the feelings of amazement that God knew me intimately. I remembered the joy of knowing that God had plans for my life. And it was amazing to hear what was said and look back 24 years later and see all that has come to pass. Admittedly, not in the way I thought at the time. I'm glad they didn't speak about all the struggle and how long some of it was going to take or I wouldn't have had so much enthusiasm. And it was fun for me to have my daughter, JL, hear what was said. She, she didn't even exist when these words were given. Some of these words were about my children, about her. And I found listening to these words impactful in several ways. First, I was struck just by the faithfulness of God in my life. He's been good to me. Yes. He's made the impossible possible. Yes. Second, I was impacted by remembering, uh, by the remembering of the passion in my soul, the joy in my heart, and the sense of anticipation I felt at that time for the future. I, I think there was a purity in my devotion to the Lord at this time. There was a softness in my heart. There was a beautiful naiveness that I had. I hadn't really lived much life yet. I wasn't jaded by disappointment yet. I wasn't tired from the struggle yet. I had little scar tissue in my mind to work through yet from failures and criticisms. It was easy to dream and to feel alive. I had more time for it, quite frankly, because I didn't have the same amount of pressures or a lot of responsibilities like children. And there's this sobering letter written and revelations to the church in Ephesus that I've been thinking about this week. And it contains these words in chapter 2. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not, and you have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me, and you don't love others as much as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place amongst the churches. And there's a lot, of course, that could be unpacked in these words. But I've always been amazed when reading this account of this church of how solid that church seemed. And then shocked by the strength of the rebuke. You even wonder how this church could do all the things they did without love. And one thing is clear through this passage. God is more concerned about our love and our devotion in our hearts to him and to others than he is about our performance in any other area. You know, you can perform pretty good for God, but have the fire in your heart go cold. You can be religious but have no intimacy in your relationship with Jesus. How do I know? Because I've done it at different times in my life. 
And one of the strongest rebukes that Jesus gave the Pharisees was when he challenged them on their hypocrisy by quoting the words of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus said to them, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God has always been more concerned with the state of our heart than anything else. And today we've just had a number of baptisms. It's been a great day already. A person's baptism to me is is probably the most significant event on a Christian's journey. In many ways, it's it's similar to a, a wedding ceremony in a person's relationship to Jesus. There's been this previous discovery of who Jesus is and and this sense of invitation, come and join me in, in a new life. In order to do that, there's this choice that's been made to let go of our old life of independence and take on his name. We're publicly making a vow that we are uniting with Christ. We are unashamedly declaring, I'm taking on the name Christian. Our future's with him. Our lives are being given to him. Paul said in Galatians 3.27, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. We are immersing ourselves in him. Our actions and attitudes, our hopes and our futures, our purposes and our dreams, our very life is found in uniting with him. To me, our conversion is like saying yes to a marriage proposal, but the baptism is the wedding ceremony that makes it official. It's very public. Vows are being made. There's no turning back. I remember my baptism. I was 14 years old, and I had just had a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit at a youth retreat on a ranch in southern Saskatchewan. My heart was soft in that moment. I wanted to follow Jesus. We had a baptism shortly after and in the church and I decided I wanted to do it because I felt Jesus calling. And it was definitely genuine. But that commitment was tested and in all honesty was found somewhat lacking through most of my teen years. The encounter I had with God at 19 and my decision at the time to follow him was somehow made with a greater understanding of what I was committing my life to. The love of God compelled me and my response was motivated by love in return. The Bible speaks of another type of baptism besides the one that takes publicly in water. It's a baptism on the inside of the Holy Spirit of God. John the Baptist, who was preaching and preparing the way for Jesus, had been baptizing people in water as an act of their repentance, but he prophesied one day about this other baptism. And he said in Matthew 3, 11, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave. I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. And he isn't just going to baptize you in water. He is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The scriptures say that our God is a consuming fire. And my friends, that is what God wants to do in our lives. He doesn't just want some religious deeds. He doesn't just want some nice uh, public ceremony where you invite a few friends. He, he, He wants us to live a life of his fire with passionate love for him burning in our hearts. To be united with him is to be immersed in him, consumed with his fire, dripping with his Holy Spirit, compelled by love, alive in intimate relationship with him. Jesus taught us, if you want to find your life, you got to lose your life. That's what baptism represents. The old man was buried. I was crucified with Christ. My new life is found in uniting with him. When I got married, my identity was changed. 
I became one, as the scripture says, with Angela. And the fruit of our intimacy produced and created life. You see, intimacy always produces life. It's one of the reasons why intimacy is always under attack, not just in our marriages, but also in our relationship with Jesus. I think the devil hates intimacy more than anything because his mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life. The message of John 15 that Jesus uh, preached was that our ability to produce great fruit was directly tied to the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus. He said in John 15, yes, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can't do anything. Church, I'm wanting us to examine our hearts today and to reflect on our relationship with Jesus. You see, the amazing thing is that often what starts with such love and passion and fire can be lost. Sometimes the very things that drove us to make vows and commitments have been lost in the drudgery and struggle and pressures of life. As a pastor, I've been a part of a lot of wedding ceremonies. Every one of them starts with such hope for the future. There's a lot of passion In those wedding ceremonies, big promises are being made, driven by an intense love. But all too often, those things are lost. Sometimes marriages fall completely apart as a result. But then there are the other ones that to me are relatable to this church in Ephesus that had lost their first love. There's a commitment that is still there. There's some good things that people can see, even applaud. But if you got to the heart of the couple, you would discover that the fire has gone out. They go through the motions, they're still together. The heart has grown cold. To me, a baptismal service is such a great time for reflection. Those of us who are here today and have been Christians for a while, we should be asking ourselves, does the fire that led to our commitment in the beginning of our walk with Jesus still burn as bright? Are we still dripping with the Holy Spirit and burning with his fire from an intimate relationship with him? I'm stirred in my own heart this morning. That God is calling me back to the beginning. I feel that I go through times of reflection in my life where God always wants me to come back to the beginning. You know, the love we had in the beginning can actually grow in intensity when it stands through trials and testings. When we have experienced some failures and disappointments and struggle, but still remain connected to the vine and intimate relationship, there is an even greater joy and love to be found. Paul said these words in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, I've always loved the passion. I want to know him, Paul said. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship There's something of a a fellowship to be found in suffering with Jesus, being conformed to his death. These verses show the cry in the heart of Paul toward God. He wants to know him. If you Greek that word out, it implies intimacy. He wants to know his power. But that word fellowship of his sufferings also talks about intimacy. I want to know the intimacy of suffering with my Savior. My experience is that struggle and pain can either lead us away from Christ or it can actually lead us to a deeper love and connection and joy if we will plug in and dig in and draw near in those moments. 
In Uganda this summer, I had an interesting experience. Most of you know that from my late teens, as God began to capture my heart, I had this dream sparked by Reinhard Bonnke. This dream of preaching the gospel and large festivals and crusades with signs and wonders and miracles being demonstrated. Some of those prophetic words I was listening to on those cassette tapes were words that pointed to these very things. Talked about it. When those doors first opened nine years ago, I was certainly terrified. But I was living a dream. I remember in the very first crusade standing under a tree in the shadows with tears streaming down my face because there was a crowd of 1,500 to 2,000 there waiting for the evangelist and the evangelist was me. And I was going to get my first opportunity. The dream had come true. But here I am now nine years into it. I'm in Uganda In July, and what started as a dream was feeling more like a nightmare. That's a little dramatic, but this is what I mean. Those festivals are hard work, they are high pressure, they are exhausting. There is so much expectation placed on me. The city is plastered with my face everywhere. The spiritual battles I face are intense. I don't know how to say it other than that they're not normal. I hate the hours on the airplanes. I've grown to detest those overseas flights. The pressure of where are we going to get the money is always there. Sickness from exhaustion and different foods are are real threats. Most of our team got sick this time. And this time in Uganda, I think more than ever before, I found myself just battling with this feeling, not of excitement and anticipation, but this feeling of bleh. I was struggling to care. I thought, this is ridiculous. Why don't I even care? I'm like, God, help me to care. I was tired before I went. It's at the end of June. It's, it's a long year of, of ministry in the church. I was tired. And in all honesty, I was more thinking about I got to get through these next 10 days and then I can get to holidays. My daughter, youngest daughter, JL, was playing football in North Carolina for Team Canada. And I was missing it. She was playing basketball with Team Sask in Nebraska. I was missing it. I love going to those events. I dearly wanted to be at them. I couldn't. I was begging God to help me in all of this. I remember thinking, man, Lord, I I feel so dead on the inside. I stepped on the stage the first night. The Holy Spirit came on me. I felt it. The mission was accomplished. We had a great night. But I felt more relief Thank you, God, that you helped me. Then I did joy. Got through day one, day two, very similar. I shared honestly with our team that afternoon the struggle I was having. I told them, I said, you know, nine years ago this was a dream, but now it feels more like a nightmare sometimes. But that afternoon of day three, I was in my room and I was praying. I was just being honest with God where I was at and asking God to help me, fix me. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just showed up in my room in such a tangible way. And I just heard the Lord just speak into my spirit these words, Joel, this wasn't your dream. This was my call on your life. And I had an epiphany. I realized something in that moment. I realized that for all these years, I've had this belief The preaching in festivals and stadiums was my idea, 
my dream, and God was just nice enough to go, okay, I'll let you do it. And now that I've done it, been there, got the t-shirt, it's a lot more work than I thought, maybe I'm ready for something else. But suddenly my eyes were being opened that actually this wasn't just a fun thing that I could do, but it was a calling that needed to be obeyed and surrendered to. My life is not my own. I gave it to Jesus 30 years ago when I knelt beside my bed and said, you can send me where you want to send me, I'll do what you want me to do. Somehow that revelation changed my whole attitude. I knelt again beside my bed, said, God, I will do it with all my heart. I suddenly felt honored God called me. I felt humbled that he would use me. I felt like I had better do it with all my heart. If God called me, I better give it everything I have. I felt a sense of joy in the struggle. I was going to do this for the Lord because he asked me to. It was costing me, so it was actually giving to the Lord something of value. At the same time, I felt the Lord was speaking to me that he wanted me to enjoy working with him. Somehow I had lost that. That night in the pre-prayer, Melinda Lalosh was a part of our team and she came to me after the prayer and she said, God just told me to tell you, have some fun tonight. Have some joy. I said, I know, he told me the same thing this afternoon. Saturday night was so powerful. I had so much joy. I saw what a privilege it was to serve the Lord. I saw lives being changed through fresh eyes. It was amazing. So Anatoly and I drove from the crusade. We just paused as we were driving. I said, look at this. Look what God has done. Look at the privilege. Why did he choose you and me to team up for something like this? Then a fascinating thing happened. The next morning on Monday morning after it was all done, we drove all the way to Kampala and I was to fly out that night so no day of rest or anything. Just get on the plane at 11.30 at night and start the long trek home. I was just dreading it. I was feeling exhausted. My, as we were just about to board, there is an announcement that comes over the intercom. Your flight to Amsterdam has been canceled. Like 20 minutes from boarding. Well, if you've ever been in, a, well, it was a new experience going through this in Uganda. We had a whole plane that needed to be taken to a hotel and literally writing my name down in pen so they can call me. What's happening? How am I getting home? There was no information coming. Just go to the hotel. We'll find you. How will you find me? Oh, we'll write your name down and your email address in pen. Okay, I hope I, you don't lose this paper because I do want to go home at some point. My first reaction was frustration. Jeff Campbell was with me and there's a little bit of panic and people were going nuts, angry. And Jeff and I just kind of looked at each other and went, well, what are we going to do? No sense getting wound up. Let's just enjoy the adventure. What do you think they're going to send us tonight? Do you think there's going to be a bus in the parking lot to get us? There was. People are losing their mind on the bus. There was just a piece that came on Jeff and I, and we're like, I wonder what kind of hotel we're going to be put up in. It was one of the most beautiful hotels I've ever been in in my life. Right on the shores of Lake Victoria, right next to a golf course. Now, there ain't too many golf courses in Uganda. I think uh, less than 10. And I happened to be beside one of them. Well, what was I going to do? <laughs> Sit around in my hotel and complain? No, I needed to go golf. So Jeff and I, we decided, what are we going to do? We've got no clubs, we've got no shoes, we've got no balls, we've got no gloves. What? 
I don't know. Do you think we can golf? So we go to the hotel manager. Hey, can we golf? He goes, nobody's ever asked me this before. <laughs> he goes, but I, I know a guy who's the member next door. And he calls him. And long story short, Jeff and I golfed two rounds uh, of golf with a member. Made some new friends. We golfed with caddies. I think I have some pictures. Do we have some pictures? Yes. Now, I particularly love this one on the top right because about halfway through, the caddies were saying, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm an evangelist. And I said, I was just in Masindi, and uh, we, had 10, uh, we had over 10,000 people there. They're looking at me like, I, we don't believe you. So I said, Jeff, uh, show them some pictures. So he pulls out his phone with my picture on billboards and the crusades and so they're looking at this phone looking at me trying to see, are they telling us the truth is this really that guy I had to take off my hat to prove that it was really me we had so, I don't remember ever having so much fun on a golf course we just got to love the guys that were with us we made some new friends we had nothing to do but golf eat and they fed us wonderfully and sleep for two days. I posted the, a picture on Facebook, some of these, and my mother was the first to reply. <laughs> and she said, here I was feeling sorry for my boy, and he was golfing, three exclamation points, go figure. <laughs> and I immediately replied with these words. Haven't you learned by now how much Jesus loves me? <laughs> but here's the powerful thing. As soon as I type that phrase and click send, the Holy Spirit just hit me. And I laid on my bed and I wept and I wept and I wept and I wept. You go, Joel, it was just a golf thing. No, it wasn't just a golf thing. It was Jesus intimately in my room saying, Joel, I love you. I love you. I love to bless you. You served me. You worked hard. I can look after you. Jeff had no idea. He's never heard this. Dried my tears by the time I opened my door. I text my mom. I said, Mom, I don't know if this is lack of sleep or what, but I am just sitting here sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Church, the point of this whole sermon, is there a point? Some of you are wondering. The point of this whole sermon is simply to bring us back to where it all begins. Our relationship with Jesus. Everything we do, our purpose, our passion, our life, all comes out of intimacy with Jesus. He can use you even when your heart is cold. His gifts will still operate. But what he wants more than anything is our hearts. He wants intimacy with us. He wants us dripping in the baptism of his Holy Spirit and fire. He wants to use us. Speak to us. Reveal himself to us. He wants us to even know the joy of finding him in the place of suffering. So the question that I'm leaving with you with today is, do you need to go back to the beginning? You know, maybe there's some of you here this morning, and you don't need to go back to the beginning. You need a new beginning. You've never known Jesus as your Savior. You've never experienced intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father. Maybe somehow you stumbled through the doors this morning looking for something. Maybe just here to see somebody you know getting baptized, but you didn't know 
that Jesus was calling you to himself. And you feel the pull of the Holy Spirit in your heart this morning. You know, we can all have an intimate relationship with God because Jesus made a way. There was a time in my life where I wasn't connected to God. Every one of us are sinners. The Bible says that our sin separates us from God. It keeps us from him. Some people think, if I'm a good person, I can maybe one day get to God. You'll never be good enough. You can't be good enough. Perfection is required. God is a holy God. On our own, we would be damned for all eternity. Lost forever. But God so loved the world. He so loved you and he so loved me. That he sent his only son Jesus. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish. But have eternal life. We sang about it in our songs this morning. Something amazing happened on the cross. The place where Jesus died. He willingly died. He chose to die. And on that cross, he became the sacrificial lamb of God. The Bible tells us that all your sins and all my sins, he took upon himself. And he allowed himself to be the sin center of the universe. And the wrath of God that was being stored up for you and me for our sins was poured out on Jesus. In our place, he took our punishment. He took all our shame, all our sin, all our guilt, all our filthiness upon himself. Even though he was perfect and he made a great exchange. Here, you can have my righteousness. I'll take your sin. And because of what Jesus did, we can be clean and washed on the inside. The barrier of sin removed and the, and the door open into the presence of God. Where we can know his voice and know him intimately and be filled with his Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. How does it happen? Simply by faith. Simply by acknowledging that you need a Savior and placing your faith in Jesus. The Bible says if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. If you're here this morning and you go, I need a new beginning. I need a start. I've never made Jesus my Savior. Never understood that I needed to do such a thing. And I'm going to give you an opportunity before we leave today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of salvation. I just want everybody to just bow their heads this morning. As we pray this prayer, I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But I am going to ask you, if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I need a new beginning. I want you to include me in that prayer of salvation just between you and me and God. Would you just lift your hands where I can see them this morning? Is there anybody here that says, I need that start? I see hands being raised all over the room today. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Okay, you can put your hands down. As I pray this prayer of salvation, in your own heart, say, Jesus, that's my prayer. Place your trust in Jesus. Something powerful is going to happen whether you feel it or not. His Holy Spirit is going to come on the inside of you. You'll be a child of the living God. Let's pray together. Those of you that uh, have known Jesus in the past, even as I pray this prayer of salvation, let there be a fresh prayer of renewal in your own heart, saying, God, I want to go back to the beginning. Jesus, we come before you today acknowledging that we are sinners and we need a Savior. We want a new beginning. We want a brand new start. We want to be the new creation, born again, that the Bible talks about. So we bring before you our sin and our shame and 
We trust that you took these things on the cross 2,000 years ago. But we just acknowledge today that they're yours, that you've taken them. And we receive your righteousness that you offered us as a free gift. We place our faith and our trust in you, Jesus. Forgive us, O oh Father. Wash us clean on the inside. Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Today, Lord Jesus, I choose to follow you for the rest of my life. Would you teach me your ways? Would you open my heart to understand more of who you are? Would you speak to me? Teach me what it's like to hear the voice of God. I want to know your voice. Show me the plans that you have for me. I want to start this relationship with you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for some of us that are older saints in the Lord. Lord, we just confess to you that sometimes the fire goes out. Sometimes we get like that church in Ephesus where maybe on the outside there's some good stuff happening, but we know that there's coldness in our heart. Lord, we just confess that we need more of your Holy Spirit. We want to be dripping in the Holy Spirit. Lord, on the embers that are in our hearts, would you just breathe the Holy Spirit on those embers? Would you ignite the fire again? Would you light us up with the flames of passion? Would the zeal for your house that consumes you consume us, O oh God? Lord, would we hear again the fresh call to, to service, to ministry, to laying our lives down, God? If we one time laid it down but then took it back, then, Lord, we want to lay it down again. Use us, oh God. Use us in powerful ways. Lord, I pray that this church wouldn't be just known for our missions and our deeds, but it would be known as a church where the people are alive with passion. A church on fire. A church of zeal. A church that intimately knows their God. A church that loves Jesus intensely and loves one another intensely. Lord, in the places of our hearts that are cold and icy, would you thaw them with the love, your love, oh God, with the fire of your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, what it means to have fellowship in suffering. Lord, I tend to say I don't want any suffering. But Lord, I know that there's a beauty and an intimacy that can be found in suffering that can't be found anywhere else. And Paul said, I want to know that fellowship. Lord, if we're going to go through suffering, we don't want to do it without knowing you. Reveal yourself. Lord, those that are really going through it today, I pray today that they would find the presence of God in a way they've never found it before see the beauty of Jesus in ways they've never seen it before. The hope of God in ways they've never felt it before. That even though the circumstances wouldn't change because their eyes have seen you in a new way, everything's changed. Lord, we want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hey, everyone. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope you enjoyed it and found something that spoke to you or blessed you in some way. That really is the heart of Harvest City Church, that you take what you've heard, learned, or experienced here and then go out and share that good news with others. So go ahead and post this video to your page, start conversations, and who knows the lives that God could transform through it. If we can support you in some way in this season, please let us know. Maybe you've decided to dedicate your life fully to Jesus. We want to hear about it. 
and celebrate with you and help you in those first steps. Connecting in to share the joys and the struggles of life is why we're here. Finding community is super important too, so if you're wondering about any of our programs for kids, youth, or adults, just reach out to us by phone or at the link below and we'll be in touch. To all of those who are partnering financially with us, thank you for your investment into the Kingdom of God. It allows us to do what He's calling us to and reach even more people. For more info on that, go over to harvestconnect.ca slash give. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our live stream chat area at harvestconnect.ca slash live. It's a great place for interaction, commenting, prayer with our online hosts, and more. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our social pages and all that good stuff too. Take care, keep living your call, and we'll see you again real soon.